influencers. Pugh. I spit on them. In a world where it seems like hard work and talent are being replaced by vanity and fakeness more and more with each passing day, the concept of the influencer is an ever-growing one in our online lives. In this compilation video, we're heading back to five of my previous uploads where I discuss the worst that influencers had to offer. From influencers that got robbed because they flexed too much, to influencers that faked being terminally ill, to influencers that have been used as military propaganda, over the past couple of years there have been so many juicy controversies and mishaps that we're going to do the deepest of dives into. So with that said, sit back, relax, maybe drift off to sleep if you want to, as I take you through the next two hours with stories of the most ludicrous influencers the internet has ever seen. Let's do this. You might not like her, but she has to be regarded as one of the most famous influencers of all time. Her name is Kim Kardashian. It's crazy. But one of the sacrifices that you make when you're as famous, and to be honest, as successful as she, is that you have a newly placed target put on your back. You would think that being this famous you would have a serious security detail, but no fortress is impenetrable. Kim Kardashian's robbery story is a very anxiety inducing and serious one, and it's set back in the early hours of Monday the 3rd of October 2016 in Paris. The city of light, the city of love, and the city in which Kim Kardashian would be met by a number of men who would tie up, gag, and rob the then 35 year old of millions of dollars. Let's take things back to September 28th, when Kim lands in Paris with her assistant and her bodyguard. It should be clear that when you're as famous as Kim Kardashian is, you're always going to have the paparazzi on you, and this is going to let any potential criminals know exactly where you are and what you're doing. According to a Vanity Fair article I found on the incident, they claim Parisian paparazzi to be some of the fiercest in the world, and they actually follow Kim all the way from the airport to her place of stay at Hotel de Portal. This is a place that's been home to many celebrity stays over the years. The Hotel de Portal say that if you want to stay there, you have to be either rich or famous or both, or be referred by someone who is. But if you're none of the above, you could just be an opportune burglar, because apparently the Hotel de Portal has some serious security problems. It had limited CCTV, mild security, and an entrance code that had not been changed in six years, making it a prime target for these criminals. A couple of days later, after a busy day in Paris for Kim, she was driven home at about 1am, this time without the usual photography tailgate that had been following her around all week. The paparazzi thought that the most memorable parts of the woman's day were over, but little did they know, they had only just begun. Now, one common theme throughout this video is that essentially all of these influencers have been specifically targeted. The robbers will always know who they are, where they are, and what they want. And they know this because the victims will usually post a picture on social media of them with a very expensive item worth stealing to these criminals. In the case of Kim, this might have just been a 20 carat diamond ring that she had on her finger worth an estimated $4 million. This post on Instagram was solely captioned with three diamond emojis. So we have a diamond ring worth an estimated $4 million on the finger of a woman whose live location is known about essentially 24 hours of the day, staying at a hotel with notoriously low security. This was the perfect storm for what was about to happen next. It's thought that the thieves arrived on bicycle, as to avoid traffic, camera and prying eyes. And according to locals, if you ride a bicycle in Paris, you know the streets well. It was 18 minutes past 2 in the morning, when a camera showed three men riding towards the hotel on bikes. Over time, they were joined by another two and then another one anonymous figures. From there, the details start to dry up, as we only have accounts from people involved to go off of, and of course, with this being such a high stress scenario, things can be misremembered very easily. Kim Kardashian said on the events, I heard a noise at the door, like footsteps, and I shouted asking, who's there? No one answered. I called my bodyguard at 2.56 a.m. Through the door, I saw two people arrive, plus the nightman who was tied up. She continued, explaining that the two men had police paraphernalia on, and one individual wore ski goggles. They grabbed me and took me into the hallway. I was wearing a bathrobe naked underneath. Then we went into the room again and they pushed me on the bed. 
It was then that they both bound and gagged the damsel, robbing her of an estimated $10 million, including the ring, and made their escape. Kim mentioned that the way in which they tied her up made her suspect that these men were not professionals, but the way in which they bound her would actually lead to them being tied to the crime, as police found DNA of the supposed ringleader on the adhesive tape they used to restrain her. A total of 12 people aged from their 20s to 70s were later set to stand trial with ties to the horrific event on that fateful evening, but not all of them were remorseful for their actions. Eunice Abbas, a 67-year-old, said that though this robbery must have traumatized Kardashian, it would teach her to be less showy with her wealth. He said, Since she was throwing money away, I was there to collect it, and that was that. Guilty? No, I don't care. The orchestrator of this crime, Omar H. Kadesh, allegedly wrote an apology letter, but whether this was just to try and get a lighter sentence is debatable. Kim has said that she's lived her life much differently since this experience, and she now cares much less for material possessions. It's a wild story for sure, but Kim Kardashian's case is just the first of many that we're going to cover today. And I say we because we're joined today by a good friend of mine, Knight, who's going to help me talk about just a few of the most fascinating stories of YouTubers and influencers who got robbed. So we're just going to bounce things between us to tell you guys these shocking and cautionary tales. Let's do it. PewDiePie. Who is the most known YouTuber of all time? If you said Mr. Beast, you're not wrong, but the OG that was the first to hit 100 million subscribers was PewDiePie. For those who don't know, PewDiePie is one of the most influential YouTubers of all time. He mainly now reacts to memes that people make on the internet, streams video games from his bedroom, and treats us with a vlog every once in a while. Back in 2019, he was the first person to hit 100 million subscribers, and that was the same year that his house in Japan got robbed. The first to reveal this news to us was his spouse, Marcia. She almost immediately posted an Instagram story saying 90% of her valuables, jewelry, luxury, and special items she had been collecting over the years were stolen. She did note the fact that the post was materialistic, but she was shocked because it was all gone, just like that. PewDiePie mentioned this at the very beginning of one of his videos, saying that in the same week, his house in England got flooded and his house in Japan got robbed. That sounds like the worst week ever. That's basically all we knew until PewDiePie decided to open up about it even further. Everything the thieves stole belonged to his girlfriend. He only had two things worthy in that house, his camera and his computer. Those thieves definitely knew what not to mess with, or maybe they didn't know that on that computer there's a YouTube channel worth much more than any of the jewelry or valuable items in that house. Maybe they're the dumb ones. I mean, they're stealing stuff, obviously that's dumb. Don't, don't steal stuff. But how is it possible that the thieves decided to only steal his girlfriend's belongings? He said that he had recently donated many of his items that lacked personal, sentimental value, or that they were just useless and collected dust. Even if some of his stuff was stolen, he said how reading philosophical works helped him to stop caring so much about material things, except those that have sentimental value, of course. Many of you don't know, but Felix is a big fan of philosophy. He's created many videos on this topic, and even once cited Aristotle before deleting his Twitter account because he hated it. His love for philosophy has helped him get through the situation without any major consequences. Unfortunately, we can't say the same for his spouse, but I'm sure PewDiePie bought her something nice to put a smile on her face again. As for our next story, we need to jump back to August of 2018, because this was the time when the Ace family came back from Disneyland to find out that they too had been robbed. If you've seen many of my videos, you would know that I've levied a lot of criticism against the Ace family in particular, but also other family channels, but at the end of the day, no one deserves to get robbed, with the mother of the family, Catherine Pays, eight months pregnant at the time. But one of the reasons I thought this would be an interesting story to bring up here is that when the family shared the disturbing news to the internet, a high portion of people thought they were faking. This kind of thing doesn't seem out of the realms of possibility for what Austin McBroom would do to try and generate some buzz for his family's channel. And since he made a video on the subject right after it happened, this raised suspicions. In this video, fans noticed that the police acted somewhat strange. To add further suspicion, while whoever burglarized the place did take a number of Catherine's handbags, for the most part, the more expensive of the family's belongings were left untouched. 
We're talking designer clothes and shoes, a wallet and a tablet, just to name a few of these items. It's peculiar that a burglar would not take any of these. So after the internet somewhat accused them of faking this crime, Catherine would take to Twitter, calling the accusations of them faking this situation, quote, ridiculous. But this didn't stop a YouTube drama Instagram account from posting this receipt of what appears to be paid actors and props being sold to Austin McBroom. Though I would take this with a grain of salt because whilst this might seem like damning evidence, it is indeed unverified. Keemstar will come out on his own Twitter, however, and post a picture of the police report to the world, which does seem like slightly more credible evidence that no, the Ace family did not self-report. There's a very good chance that when they were away on holiday, probably posting about it on social media, someone who knew where the house was actually did rob them. This would be backed up by the fact that according to a source that I found, it was reported that a house roughly half a mile away was also robbed on the same day, potentially suggesting that this robber might have been on a bit of a spree, even though it could be that these are two unrelated incidents. And with their robbing video being one of their most viewed ever, they would have the means and the motive of faking this. Nonetheless, all these years later, and I don't think that anything substantial has come out about whether this thief has been caught. I don't think there were many big breakthroughs in this case, so I can't be one to confirm or deny if this burglary happened in the way that the Ace family said it did. Still, it's very curious to say the least. Florence Mursky. Sherman Oaks, a neighborhood in Los Angeles that has a reputation for being part of the wealthy area of the Valley, is also a neighborhood where Florence Mursky's multi-million dollar mansion is located. If you haven't already, go get some popcorn because this one is something out of a movie. Have you ever seen or maybe tried that cannabis shaped chocolate called Coco Nugs? Florence Mursky is a co-founder of Coco Nugs and an influencer that's been in a relationship with Scott Storch for three years. Scott Scott Storch being a Grammy-winning record producer. Armed robbers decided his expensive mansion is a must-do. At the time of the robbery, two women were house-sitting for Florence. The housekeeper and her friends were peacefully sleeping when the light being turned on inside the mansion woke them up. They didn't know what was going on, but the panic kicked in when they realized they were not alone in the room. Three robbers were holding them at gunpoint. Tears of fear started running down their cheeks while one of the robbers improvised and handcuffed them using thick zip ties. Before they started raiding the mansion and looting for some type of treasure, they took phones from the housekeepers who were absolutely terrified. The police said one of the robbers had been armed with a pistol and two others with a rifle. Doesn't sound like a random attack to me. Imagine falling asleep after a long day, craving some good rest, and then waking up with three guns pointed at your face. After the robbers took what they came for, they fled the scene in an unknown direction in a blue sedan. At the time of the robbery, Mursky was in New York, but the two hostages figured out they could use a ring doorbell camera to alert her. As soon as she realized what was going on, she called the police at about 3 a.m. from New York, adding she saw an image of a tied person screaming for help. There were no signs of forced entry, so investigators are assuming robbers made their way in by picking a door lock. There is a theory that this may have been someone from the inside, since Mursky said robbers already knew where to look. She stated that robbers went straight to her closet where she kept her safe. She was suspicious because of this, so she offered a $100,000 reward for those who could capture the suspect. The stress she went through had put fear in her bones and affected her mental health. The safety of her two and a half year old kid was the only thing on her mind. So she decided she was not going to be going back to her $5 million mansion. Fortunately, no one was harmed in this robbery. That's the most important thing. As for this next case, I want to take the time to slow things down and have a serious conversation. If you've watched my videos for a while, you'll know that I'm really not a big fan of flashy things or superficiality or vanity. And it's a reason why I'm interested in this kind of thing. It's a reason why I'm making this type of video. But after hearing Yanni Sharalambas' story, I knew there was so much more to this kind of thing that I hadn't really considered before. This is the story of how he was bound, beaten and robbed in his own home. So Yanni, as he more commonly goes by, in case you don't know him, owned a business that customised luxury cars for celebrities. He noted Bakary Sanya, Simon Cowell and Harry Styles as some of his customers, as well as the Sidemen members Rosa Shaw and KSI. 
It was actually Yanni that was the guy that customized KSI's iconic purple Lambo. But in his video describing the events of his robbery, Yanni made a point that kind of hit home to me. That yeah, he liked to splash his cash on luxury items, he liked to flex and show off, but at the end of the day, he worked for it. So should he not be able to spend his money on luxury items and flashy stuff if he so pleases? And to be honest, even though I still don't like it, I reconsidered my stance after I heard his point. But after what happened to him, I'm sure that Yanni could also understand my position a little bit more. Because in his video, he would describe the events leading up to his robbery and even said it himself. Back in 2016, he went to Harrods to buy a Richard Mills watch with his friend. His friend, upon learning his intention to buy this watch, decided to record a video of him purchasing it, with Yanni putting up a picture of his watch and receipt on social media. For those of you who don't know, Richard Mills watches are incredibly expensive, and the one that Yanni bought was £94,000. He spent the best part of a hundred grand on a damn watch. He's in the big leagues, he's making it big, he's cringing in the modern day though, because let's be fair, this way of acting is just a bit cringe. Flash forward to July 2016 and it's just after his 40th birthday. He then goes to a club in London. And just a little thing about London before we carry on with this, in the last couple of years especially, there has been a huge surge in armed robbery in the city. London is the beating heart of the UK, it's one of the most historical cities in the world, but it has a crime problem. If you're caught in the wrong side of the city, walking the streets with something flashy, and a moped with two guys pulls up next to you, good luck. Yanni posts his night out on his story, and because he doesn't drink, drives back from the club and goes to sleep. After falling asleep, he's suddenly awoken to being hit on the head with a blunt object that he thought was a screwdriver. A total of three men had entered his room and were shouting at him to start handing over his possessions. They take his watches, his earrings, and then one of the men say, Yanni, where's your Richard Mills? And this changes everything for the victim because he now knows that this is a targeted attack. He gets whacked around the head with a baseball bat after telling them that his watch is back at Harrods being repaired for a scratch. And afterwards, the robbers tape up his hands and move around the house, looking for more valuables. And they eventually find a safe, taking even more watches and about £10,000 cash. The thieves then left and the police were contacted, but nobody has ever been caught. The very same thieves would break into his house once again a short while after, but this time Yanni wasn't home and his safe was emptied. Just like Kim Kardashian, Yanni has since said that this incident has caused him to rethink his attitude towards material possessions and to not flex his wealth so much on the internet. Ali A. Ali A is a British YouTuber who is one of the luckiest on this list of unlucky influencers that got robbed. Ali A is one of the most popular Fortnite content creators that has amassed over 3 billion views. Lately, he posts reaction videos and uploads new videos regularly every few days. He lives in London, where car thefts are at an all-time high. If you plan on visiting London with your car, make sure to choose where you park it very carefully. Even though Ali A chose where he would park his then-new Audi A1 very carefully, his car still got broken into. In December of 2015, he uploaded a video called I Got Robbed, explaining to us how he went to London for a birthday party where he spent two days while also recording a vlog for his YouTube channel. He parked his car in a pretty decent, non-shady area. He even parked it back, so that way the trunk couldn't be opened. This is where he made a huge mistake though, by forgetting to lock his vehicle. Unfortunately, the auto-locking feature on his car just didn't work. When he came back to get his car, he didn't notice anything unusual. That's until he got back home, opened the trunk, and realized his bags were missing. Those bags contained high-end recording gear, and what makes this even worse is that he had two days worth of content on that camera. As a fellow content creator, I already lose my mind when I forget to like flick on my mic when I'm recording something. I couldn't imagine the pain of losing two days worth of footage in just a swoop. Ugh, it, it, it sounds painful. It sounds so painful. He assumed that a person saw him forget to lock the car after he parked it, waited until he was gone, and since the thief couldn't open the trunk, he probably got in the car and stole everything that he could reach in his trunk. Additionally, the thief didn't even know if there was anything of value in the car because of the tinted glass. He just went for it and relied on his luck. He ended up stealing more than a thousand pounds worth of equipment. 
This is all the information we have since our only source was his video. If you've ever had something stolen from you, you know it's not the greatest feeling in the world. It's even worse if you can't replace the stolen things just by buying a new one, let's say because it was like a gift. Later, he went out and bought a brand new camera, but he was visibly sad because he had lost all the great content that he recorded. I, I feel for you, man. There, there really is nothing worse than losing the content that you worked so hard on. As for our next story, this is the tale of Troy Williams, also known as Candy. He's a businessman and influencer, being quite good at both. Having over 165,000 followers on Instagram, and evidently being good enough at business so that he can afford a $130,000 luxury Mercedes. However, in July 2021, a group of teenagers decided to ransack his car, and they got much more than they bargained for. The turquoise Mercedes was parked in the driveway of Candy's house when the teens attacked, and roughly 20 to 30 minutes after the crime took place, the influencer was made aware of it. Now here's the thing about teenagers, they're a wild bunch, but they can often be way too cocky for their own good. I know I was. But these guys took it much further than most because the teens that did this filmed themselves doing it and actually tagged Candy in the video. This was a targeted attack. They knew exactly what they were doing and who they were doing it to. But what's really out of line is that because these guys followed Candy on Instagram, they would very likely know that his wife was pregnant at the time. And I'm not just talking one or two months pregnant, she was eight months about to burst pregnant. Candy and his wife were moving some stuff from their Mercedes when they left the car door open and the thieves decided to strike. These lowlife scum really committed a crime against a pregnant woman and Candy decided to go on the damn warpath. He offered a cash reward to any of his followers that might know what happened to give him the information surrounding the perpetrators and the return of his stolen items. According to Candy, his wallet was stolen as well as a few personal items with these being worth a few thousand Australian dollars. Candy took a lot of pictures and videos and gave updates about the situation, and in this clip, he says that within one hour, his followers were able to track down these guys and caught them dead to absolute rights. He got their full names, partners' addresses, parents' addresses, he got absolutely everything. He took a visit to their parents' houses because Candy claims that the police just tend to give these kids a slap on their wrist and then just send them on their way with no consequences. Which fair play to him because I can't imagine anything more shameful than someone you've just robbed walk into your house and tell your parents that you're a thieving piece of shit. One parent in particular he said was crying and didn't know what to do with her son. Candy went on to say that literally a week before the Mercedes attack, the same kids had also stolen a Ferrari, went through the courts and were again just allowed to get back out with no consequences. He pled with these teens to change their ways because eventually they will come into contact with someone who might defend their property or seriously push charges, it's only a matter of time. But nonetheless, Candy was eventually able to get his family's stuff back, so this story does have more of a happy ending. The world's most valuable resource. An entity grander than life itself and more treasured than any amount of imagined riches. To many, they're more important than survival's most necessary needs. Water, food, shelter, clothing, health and safety. <laughs> These all pale in comparison. They unite people of all creeds, colours, religions and walks of life. They're truly one of the universe's most agreeable common denominators. From the peaks of Mount Fuji to the lakes of Los Angeles and everywhere in between, we all know their name. Purely perfect goddesses among us mortals forced to walk this earth in sin. Of course I'm talking about e-girls. In this video, I'm doing a deep dive on the subculture to unearth the hidden realities of one of nature's most seemingly glorious creations. But here, in this moment, we will ask if this is really the case. From the dangers that these women face every day for merely doing their job, to the leaked group chat that almost ended it all, these are the darkest depths of the e-girl community. Now this is naturally a large task here, and I think the first and most appropriate place to start is to talk about some of the misconceptions in the e-girl subculture, because we need to understand what they are and how they're perceived before we can start talking about the implications of their presence online. 
So an e-girl is generally defined as an active internet user, likely an anime or gaming fan, who have cultivated an aesthetic that blends emo, skater and Japanese styles into their look. The term has apparently been around for a lot longer than you'd expect, first appearing in the Urban Dictionary in 2009. Back then, it was deemed as an insult. But it was as of the rise of TikTok that these girls reclaimed their word, and this is when they really came into the limelight, quickly becoming one of this generation's most large and recognisable subcultures. However, because this is such a vast community, a lot of people generalise, or they tar them all with the same brush. They assume that all e-girls are young, depressed, pill-popping, promiscuous introverts. And though yes, there are definitely some young, depressed, pill-popping, promiscuous introverts in the mix, this isn't representative of all of them. Just most of them. Some e-girls are out there dancing on TikTok because they're happy, some e-girls have social lives, some of them aren't depressed. I think. I'd wager at least one or two of them aren't depressed. So now we know how e-girls are stereotyped, let's talk about the time they use their good looks and wily charm to convince a generation of young boys to grab a gun and join the military. These monsters, these sirens have sung their song and only beeswax in thine ears shall help you resist their temptations. So the story here is that there's a TikToker called Heilujan who back in January of this year went viral because of her content where she posts thirst traps inside helicopters and posts selfies with semi-automatic weapons. She's described herself as a psychological operations specialist which has made people wonder, is this girl actually helping to recruit people to the US Army? Has she been employed to try and recruit a bunch of simpy young men to strap on their boots and shave their head? Her damn website is called Psychops, which is an overt reference to PSYOPs, which means psychological operations. So while it's definitely possible, because this is just so blatant, I'd guess that it's more likely that this is just a marketing strategy to help her grow online, giving her an angle. But I mean, I'm sure that the US military has done stranger things in the past. And the strangest thing is, and you're not going to believe me when I say this, but the more you look into it, the more you might start to see just a bit of credibility to this theory. This isn't some isolated incident, and Lujan isn't the only military thirst trap. Hashtag Miltok is a rapidly growing area of TikTok, and users such as Bailey Crespo and Kayla Salinas have both been described as e-girls using Sereno sex appeal to lure the internet simps into the armed forces by a day's digital article which I read while researching this topic. This article also mentions Natalia Fadif, who is a little bit less subtle in approach, going as gun waifu online and having 2.7 million followers on the platform. According to this article, she's an Israeli influencer and an IDF soldier who uses waifu aesthetics and catgirl cosplay to peddle pro-Israel propaganda. The article goes on to say that she poses to camera Ahigao style with freshly manicured nails wrapped neatly around a Glock. The ooooification of the military functioning as a cutesy distraction from the shadowy colonial context. So you're telling me that armies around the world are about to get ooooified? Because if so, count me in! I mean, let's just say you're in the middle of an active war zone, just minding your own business, and then from out behind you, whack! You just get knocked out, blackout. You wake up, just chained to a wall. You look around, you're like, oh, what's going on? You see two e-girls just doing a little fucking TikTok dance over your, your like, body before you're about to get tortured for some information. I could get behind that, but there is a problem that could come from this. As the article says, influencers could soon become weapons in a government's arsenal. Influencers have influence by design, it's in their name. And recruitment rates in the military have been dropping substantially when comparing Gen Z to previous generations. So if all's fair in love and war, what's to stop these thirst traps from trying to boost those numbers? And if all of this seems a bit far-fetched to you, let it be known that in December 2022, it was reported by Vice's tech wing called Motherboard that the US military had plans to recruit Gen Z via very unconventional methods, such as through Twitch, esports, and the WWE. WWE. Particularly, they put an emphasis on trying to recruit women, black and Hispanic people because I guess the US Army just isn't diverse enough. The Motherboard article also claims that the US military name-dropped creators such as Swag and Alex Zedra in their plans, who apparently refused to comment when asked to by Vice. I'm seriously considering making a full video on this topic because I haven't seen many people talk about it and there's so much more that I haven't gone over that I potentially could, so please let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in seeing that. 
but because these e-girls have such a strong ironclad grip on their impressionable chronically online and let's be honest desperate fans there has to come a point where you ask the question are these fans being exploited Okay, now this is a really interesting conversation because different people are going to view it very differently. And we're not talking about e-girls that are just doing some funny dances on TikTok or the ones that genuinely stream games because they love to do it. We're talking about the ones that blur the lines into sex work. The ones that dress provocatively, the ones that play their sexiness up to the camera, and they'll usually sell some sort of goods or services. And I'm going to primarily focus on Twitch because that's where this kind of thing seems the most prevalent. The fascinating thing when it comes to these types of women is that some people would say that the very nature of their employment would exploit them because women that are in sex work have notoriously been taken advantage of over the years. There's no denying that. And even though a lot of these people would not classify what they do as sex work because all they do is sit in a kiddie pool and make ASMR noises into a microphone, it's no secret that there is an overt sexual element in that to some people that are consuming their content. These people, depending on their levels of desperation, might donate some money and some of them might donate a lot more money, and some of them might donate a ton of their money. Thus, some people would say that these e-girls are exploiting their audience via using their body to get whatever they want, or playing up a persona to the camera, or just selling their bathwater, like what? Now, it's important to say that some people just donate to streamers to thank them for their work. These people are entertainers. They're there when their audience are going through difficult times. It's obviously the teenage boys that are using their mum's credit cards which are the problem, or even worse yet, fully grown adults that are bankrupting themselves to get their favourite streamer to thank them in the chat. But I don't want to oversimplify here because there are a lot of varying reasons why one might simp for a woman online and also let it be known that it's not just men simping towards women which is a problem, there's women on women, men on men, men on women, women on men and all the rest. During my research I was able to track down this website now called epal.gg but formerly known as ego.gg. And it's a platform in which you pay some money, seemingly about £5 for 30 minutes, though some streamers' prices are higher, and after you pay them, you can play with these streamers or talk to them in chat. Guys or girls or whoever, at the end of the day, these sorts of streamers do not care about you, you are just a paycheck for them. This study that I found on the subject drew two conclusions from this. One of which was the widespreading relevancy of gender in games. This study was written by Christine H. Tran in 2022, and though it's a bit wordy throughout, it ends on a conclusion that's an important aspect of e-girl culture. It reads, Hubs for self-titled e-girls such as Twitch and TikTok reflect a micro-celebrity ecosystem where the language of realness, or at least believability, is a valued commodity. And that's where we're heading next, because this video would be impossible to talk about without mentioning the lifeblood of being an e-girl, and that is accessibility. Never before have the people that you're obsessed with been so easy to contact. But let me say that again from the creator's perspective, because never before has it been so easy for people obsessed with you to contact you. So yeah, I don't know if I'm beating a dead horse with this one. I'm sure you've heard of parasocial relationships in the past. Just in case you haven't though, it's a buzzword that's just had all life sucked out of it by content vampires. And honestly, it drives me a little batty to talk about. But if you look in the news, it doesn't seem as though things are getting any better. Amaranth is perhaps the most famous creator on the receiving end of this because literally as of like a week ago when I wrote the script for this video, the creep returned. If you don't know her story, to summarise it, she has an Estonian stalker who's flown to Houston where she lives multiple times now in an attempt to, like, be with her I guess? Apparently he obsessively DM'd her asking her why she didn't pick him up at the airport and whatnot despite the fact that she doesn't even know him. I mean, just strange, creepy thinking. This person clearly needs help and clearly needs a restraining order. And clearly this isn't a one-off kind of deal for people on the internet, especially women. Valkyrie was stalked by a guy who also hopped in a plane to get into contact with her. Then obviously Mira, who had her home vandalized by a stalker. Nico, who had her stalker write a 246 page anthology on her and how she led him on, and then also Pokimane, Sweet Anita, and essentially every other large female creator that you can think of. Let me be clear that creepy behaviour is not exclusive to women online and it's definitely not exclusive to e-girls because everyone gets it. Blokes get it, I've had it before. It generally happens nowhere near as frequently to men and usually not as severely. 
and I'd like to think that I'm well versed in talking about this because this topic in particular was a large part of my 2022 documentary Discontent, where I was able to actually get a first-hand account of stalking and harassment from Kiwo, a famous streamer on Twitch. I've criticised a lot of the more negative aspects of ego culture so far in this video, and don't worry, I will continue to do so, but I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, these people are humans too. It's very easy to forget that. And I think it's so important to carry on talking about this because it doesn't look like too much is changing, and I honestly worry that we could be looking at tragedy not too far in the distant future. There is a very real chance of something awful happening if we don't figure out a way to stop this kind of behaviour. I usually don't speak from the heart very often in my videos, but I just wanted to say that. Anyways, on a less depressing note, let's add a little bit of spice into this video and talk about the e-girl group chat leak. So this story became headline news in online spaces, and if you've never heard of it before, strap yourself in, buckle up, because this is going to be one of the wildest stories you hear all week. So we need to take things back to January of this year, literally five or six weeks ago, because it was then that a Twitter user by the name eGirlfriend, otherwise known as Law, tweeted this, which are a few screenshots of this absolutely rancid group chat between several eGirls who have been named and shamed as Lil Rory Vert, Pixel Girlfriend, Swoowookie, Super Etchy, and then this girl here known as Amber, but her handle was at Mimsy. These girls were exposed to the world red-handed, just saying the most spiteful, vindictive, and mean-spirited things to others. They were accused of being fatphobic, and also of reportedly using racist language too. Like, there were a lot of n-words apparently being used, and I'm not talking about your nincompoops and nimrods either. These e-girls were exposed for the whole world to see. Their group chat was essentially like the burn book from Mean Girls, in that iconic scene, and like these girls had to do some damage control. They started by deleting some tweets and messages before immediately hopping on another group chat, <laughs> chatting more shit, and then getting exposed for it again. Like at that point, it's just game over. Your online career is just in the gutter. Eventually, this all got a bit too much for the girls who one by one would delete their Twitter accounts. Let it be known too that these weren't just nobodies, a lot of these women had a fair following online, some of them hundreds of thousands of followers. And it just goes to prove the point that we discussed a moment ago, that you really don't know your favourite creators at all, so there's no point in forging a one-sided relationship with them. This normally seems like an incredibly hard thing to come back from, but just as Wang pointed out, I don't think anyone was paying attention to these girls because of their upstanding moral character, so we'll have to wait and see. And I'll have to wait and see what your take on this next story is, because did you know that in the past, people have accused the ego community of cultural appropriation? Yeah, if you weren't aware of this, over the past few years, there have been some people that have criticised the gamer girl and e-girl aesthetic of appropriating different culture styles, particularly Japanese. Now, it's no secret that the e-girl aesthetic is at the very least heavily inspired by Japanese streetwear. It's noted at the very top of the Wikipedia page that aspects of East Asian culture, such as anime and K-pop, are inspirations for the style. But it's obviously not a clear rip-off, because it was also inspired by punk, emo, and skater aesthetics, which are more traditionally Western. Additionally, if we're talking about characters that inspired the movement, many people claim Ramona Flowers and Harley Quinn to be pop culture icons that have their styles drawn from in the aesthetic. So clearly, it's not as black and white as the idea that the e-girl movement has been plainly ripping off from Japanese culture. But this hasn't stopped a number of journalists and writers from creating online articles about it. For example, two years ago, Ashley Barzen wrote an article titled, This recent trend among gamers isn't an aesthetic, it's racism. And in this article, she claims that e-girls had come under fire at the time for Asian fishing, which is essentially where white people especially were changing their looks to seem more Asian via the use of makeup. Apparently, white girls were using makeup to give themselves more traditionally East Asian facial features. She cited Slightly Kiki, a Korean-American TikToker with about 50,000 followers as a source. And Slightly Kiki admitted that this was neither an important nor a pressing issue for the Asian community, but it fetishized the culture, and it added to an anti Asian sentiment. It reduced them to what Barden called an overall sexy caricature of what Asians look like. In 2021, this same sentiment was shared by Sid Hoped of the Daily Nexus, the newspaper of the University of California, Santa Barbara, in an article titled, Your Gamer Girl Aesthetic Has Real Consequences. 
and it cites a Teen Vogue article to back its point that back in 2021, there was a TikTok trend called the Fox Eye Challenge, whereby participants use makeup to try and allow their eyes to appear more Asian. Now, of course, not every e-girl is taking on the Fox Eye Challenge, but it is a small, perhaps unwelcome part of the e-girl community. And more broadly, our generation, in the West at least, seems very invested in East Asian culture. But whether they care about Asians as much as they claim to might be another story. The author of the Daily Nexus piece writes, They do not want Asian people around. Instead, they want our food, our clothing, our trends and our aesthetics. But not us. Never us. Which makes me want to ask any and all Asians watching this video, what do you think? Is the ego aesthetic and culture appropriation or appreciation? This is a belief held by a small number of people, no doubt, but this opinion does exist. The Huffington Post, for example, had similar concerns. But this might be stemming from a more positive place, that being that East Asian popular culture specifically is becoming way more common in the West. And is culture not meant to be shared and enjoyed? But this might come at a bit of a price too, because throughout my research I found one common thread, a warning in place, and that is the sexualization of Asian culture and how e-girls have infantilized it. And if you don't know the term, it means to treat people as children regardless of their age. And in reference to what we're talking about, to infantilize a look that you also sexualize, I mean, this is clearly problematic. So let's have an open conversation about society's beauty standards towards women in particular. Traditionally, they're held to a standard where they're primarily sought after in their 20s. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are still plenty of absolutely stunning women in their 30s and 40s or even 50s who might be considered very beautiful, but generally, if you compare them with the ages of the most sought after men, there's just no contest. I took a look at the Economic Times' Sexiest Man Alive for the past 10 years for research purposes, and I found that the average age of their Sexiest Man Alive was 40.3. In comparison, in Esquire's Sexiest Woman Alive, the average age of the winner was 30.3. Or you could take Elizabeth Brutch's 2018 study of online dating, where she found that while a woman's desirability on dating apps consistently dropped from the time she's 18 until the time she's 60, a man's desirability, on the other hand, actually increases with age, peaking at about 50 before dropping off. This study also covered both sex's preference in ethnicity and education level, so pause if you want to have a look at it. But relating this back to e-girls, even their name, e-girls, could be considered infantilizing. Obviously, you have e-boys on the flip side, so it's not exclusively a female issue, but the underlying theme here is that youth is at the center of beauty standards. Clearly, there are biological factors for this that we just can't escape. Youth is peak fertility, youth is peak strength and physicality, but is this aesthetic going too far. The Daily Nexus article writes, These gamer girls take to Twitch and actively stream in this Asian fishing makeup, often dressing in infantile clothing and acting in a submissive demeanor that reinforces the concept of Asian women as subservient, childish, and dainty. So clearly, infantilization and racial stereotypes are going hand in hand. It's strange that this hasn't been spoken more about. But there is also a flip side of the argument, and there are two points I want to bring up here. Firstly, e-girls are not the first generation of women to be infantilized. Since the dawn of media, and even prior to it, it's happened over and over. It happened to Britney Spears 20 years ago, Marilyn Monroe 70 years ago, and I'm sure to many more before then. But secondly, there's the idea that this sort of aesthetic is only sexualized if you think it is. There have been a few e-girls who say that their method of dress is merely self-expression, and so if you're sexualizing them, that's on you, not them. Blaming women for how they dress has never been a good argument in many people's minds. Just because you dress a certain way doesn't necessarily mean anything, it might just mean that you like the clothes. I, for example, have always taken large inspiration from the rocker and greaser aesthetic in my style. I just think it's cool and it's just that. It doesn't mean I want to be living in the 50s and it doesn't mean I want to be sexualized, regardless of leather jackets being damn sexy. I don't know, what do you guys think? I wanted to open up this dialogue and I really hope that this video has made you think a bit differently about the ego subculture and aesthetic. You are currently the victim of extremely subtle but effective subliminal propaganda and have absolutely no clue. Whether you live in the United States, China, North Korea, Russia, the Middle East, or anywhere else in the world for that matter, nobody is safe. 
there's a possibility that your favourite social media personalities have been reached out to by the government to further their political aims. And there's also a possibility that they've been a product of the government this entire time. Now, you might be asking yourself, how does some tinfoil hat limey know the secret covert plans of the most powerful governments on Earth? And to answer that, we need to take things back to my video covering the darkest depths of the eGirl community. I swear this has a point. For a little recap, in that video, I spoke about this day's digital article written back in January of this year, titled How eGirl Influencers Are Trying to Get Gen Z Into the Military. This article sets its crosshairs on a TikToker known as Hey Luhan, a member of the US Army. Hey Luhan had 363,000 followers when the article was written a few months ago, and since then she's more than doubled to roughly 730,000 today. The article writes that the 20-year-old makes thirst trap videos inside military helicopters, she makes cutesy unboxing videos, she fires literal weaponry while going tee hee hee, and her official website is literally called Psychops, which is a reference to the term Psyops, an abbreviated term referring to psychological warfare. I said in the original video that I don't actually think that she's a psyop because if she was, I don't feel as though she would show her hand like that. But I also mentioned that the US military have planned to do weirder things in the past, like literally thinking about nuking the moon. So understandably, it's kind of hard to predict their next move, and this would fit in with what the US military have been planning to do recently because over the past few months there have been leaks from within the military that have provided proof that they have in fact been using influencers to try and up their recruitment rates. I believe that it was Vice's tech wing Motherboard who was the first to cover it, at least I got my information for this incident off Motherboard, and I touched on this a bit in my eGirls video, but I really want to delve into it further in this one before going off and talking about other countries that are doing the same thing. Before we get into the meat of this Motherboard article, I think I should clarify that this is not meant to be a political video. I understand that issues of the military are inherently a part of politics, but the point of this video is not to slander the military, I completely get that it has a purpose. At the same time, I believe that if a young person is about to potentially put their life on the line to join the military, their decision should be completely their own and they shouldn't be subliminally coerced into joining. All of the information that I'm about to share with you guys is technically public knowledge because there have been articles and studies written about it, I'm just passing on this information to you so we can have a conversation about it. So without further ado, let's do it. So this article is called US Army Plan to Pay Streamers Millions to Reach Gen Z Through Call of Duty, and it was written by Joseph Cox in December of 2022. It claims that Motherboard obtained some internal documents from the US Army that outlined how it planned to spend its recruitment funding. These documents showed that the largest portion of its split budget was going to go to Twitch, but overall it identified gaming communities as a large target, wanting to drive campaign awareness across multiple key areas of the gaming landscape, including esports, influencers, top mobile games and events. You can see that they spent vast amounts of money on the Call of Duty esports event and the Halo TV show on Paramount+. The documents then started name dropping individual creators such as Stone Mountain 64, Swag and Alex Zedra, all of whom you could assume would have been paid vast amounts of money if the campaign went through. You can see that Stone Mountain for example would have been paid $150,000. I mean that's insane amounts of money for an individual creator. Let me just say that if you guys see my next video be about how good the UK military is, let it be known that Dishy Rishi, the UK Prime Minister, has dished me out the good good. <laughs> 150 bags, yes please. But it's not just individual creators that were going to be a part of the military's plans, Optic, the esports team, were too. According to the article, they've worked with the military before. $300,000 was their asking price. And even that was nothing compared to some of the other plans though. The documents obtained by Motherboard revealed that the US military were planning a $600,000 deal with IGN and an even more lucrative $675,000 deal with the WWE. According to Motherboard, neither IGN nor the WWE responded to them when asked about the documents. I'm not exactly shocked about the WWE partnership, the two have definitely had a long history together. I don't think the WWE has ever tried to make that a secret. IGN on the other hand, I am a bit more shocked with. They don't seem like the traditional company that the military would try to work with, and by all means, they probably aren't. That's when you have to take a step back and look at the target demographic of this campaign. 18 to 24 year olds of diverse racial backgrounds and more women too. They're targeting Gen Z. 
I brought this pot up in the original video covering it, but in the USA, it's been well documented that recruitment rates for the military are dropping. Our generation doesn't seem to have the same affection for the military that the ones before us did, and since those older generations will one day have to hang up their boots, they need to try and speak to the youth. However, with the army's strict rules on who's allowed to sign up, even the amount of people eligible has been vastly shrinking over the past few years. I think that both the WWE and gaming were traditionally seen as boys' hobbies, but over the past decade especially, we've seen girls really leave their mark on both. And I'd say that today, it actually makes sense that these could be places for the military to look for their target demographic. An army spokesperson said on the matter, the Army's marketing goal for sponsorships are similar to all of our advertising purchases, which is to reach a specific market in support of Army recruiting. Ad recall and favorability are important as they are both industry accepted measures of effectiveness of the advertising and sponsorships we purchase. In Army marketing, we must meet the youth where they are, and that is online say what you want about that, but to me, I'd actually argue that it's a fair point because the US military have been doing recruitment campaigns forever. To me, this just seems to be the next step or the evolution of these campaigns, and it's not going to go away. I actually think it's only going to become more commonplace, and so your favourite streamer in the future could be working for good old Uncle Sam. But of course, this isn't a purely American phenomenon, there are many countries in the world that are just as guilty too, so for the rest of this video, we're going to be taking a bit of a world tour to talk about social media based military propaganda. And to do that, we're starting in North Africa, where you can find a country that's home to one of the most revered and studied ancient civilizations in the world, of course we're talking about Egypt. Now Egypt is a bit of a strange one because you guys probably didn't expect it to be in this video standing alongside a bunch of other countries that have notoriously active militaries. But in January of 2021, Ruth Michelson and Michael Safi wrote an article for The Guardian titled Sugarcoated Propaganda? Middle East Taps Into Power of Influencers. In this article, it writes that there were 20 Egyptian Instagram influencers that were selected to work with the Egyptian government to try and paint the country in a better light to the youth. Apparently, Egypt has quite a bad reputation for its human rights record, a point I discussed in a video that I made a while back whilst covering TikTok. If I remember correctly, the gist of the story was that there were two women who were arrested unfairly on human trafficking charges because they were creating provocative TikToks. According to the article, Egypt is also notorious for locking up journalists, becoming what Reporters Without Borders have claimed to be part of the world's most dangerous regions for journalists. So clearly the country has some image issues and they've taken to influencers to try and fix this. According to the Guardian article, none of the influencers that they spoke to about this development have claimed to be paid by the Egyptian government. Instead, there seems to be a shared sentiment between the influencers that partnering up with the government will help to boost their following. Whether or not this is true, I don't know for sure, but I do know that governments in the Middle East would know better than most just the power that social media can bring. In 2011, Egypt had a revolution to protest against an increase of police brutality under their then president, Hosni Murabak. Tens of thousands of Facebook pages and groups were created to organize the revolution, which ended in Murabak's arrest. So clearly, Egypt know that social media can be an incredibly powerful tool when utilized correctly, and many critics think that Egypt's government is now planning on utilizing it. The article quotes pro-democracy activist Iyad el-Baghdadi saying, It's a battle for legitimacy through narratives. If you want to get a leg up in the battle over narrative, you control the public sphere. And so, if you can influence the people that the public are listening to, if they can be a puppet or a proxy for what you're saying, you control the public, and therefore, the narrative. In Egypt, more than most countries, it seems as though the people really do have a love for public figures and quite a particular disdain for the government. Case in point, back in 2018, Egypt had a national election between these two men, the incumbent Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and his rival Musa Mustafa Musa. Between the two of them, the president received 97% of the votes. Shockingly though, human rights groups would call the election a farce. Their reason for saying so being that in a well-functioning democracy, 97% of the vote would be essentially impossible. But even more shocking than that, during this election, more than 1 million voters decided to vote for Mohamed Salah, a generational football talent playing for the best team in the world, Liverpool. 
But the strangest thing about this was that Salah wasn't even running for office, he was just having the season of his life, banging in goals left and right for Liverpool, creating a Premier League record for goals scored in a 38 game campaign. This is all to say that the public figure Mohamed Salah, who wasn't even running for president, was technically the runner up to El Sisi, who is still the president today. Coincidentally, in 2018, the same year as this election, the government passed a law to regulate social media, under which anyone with more than 5,000 followers could now be accused of spreading fake news or inciting others to break the law. Make no mistake, these government hired influencers are exactly that government hired influencers. Do they really have your best interests at heart? Or do any influencers, for that matter? In a job as morally bankrupt as influencer, I would say probably not. But from Africa to Europe, we're heading over to Russia now, whose military is currently a bit more active than most for some reason. There are a lot of things that could be said when it comes to Russia's recent activities and some of the tactics that they've employed to try and convince the country that the attack was justified, but one of these tactics was to hire a bunch of social media influencers to spread Kremlin propaganda on TikTok. Once again, Vice has come up clutch with another article, this one written by David Gilbert back in March of 2022, so this would have been right after Russia began occupying mainland Ukraine. Numerous campaigns have been coordinated in a secret telegram channel that directs these influencers on what to say, where to capture videos, what hashtags to use, and when exactly to post the video. And even though TikTok has banned new uploads from users located in Russia, the campaigns did not stop. The Telegram channel is run by an unnamed administrator who recruits social media influencers and told Vice he was a journalist. The administrator lays out requirements such as minimum views required and the date and time the video needs to be posted. He also asks potential recruits how much money they demand per post. It remains unknown who's paying for these campaigns. The message on Telegram told creators what audio track to use, which emojis to use, and what text to post on their videos. I mean, this would make sense for a country to do. Not just Russia, but any country that risks upsetting its population. Because when you look at the people that would listen to influencers, it's young people, right? The older people might not even know what an influencer is if they even care about them to begin with. In the case of Russia, independent polls suggest that the majority of Russian citizens support the war in Ukraine, but when you break those numbers down, you'll see that many young people actually disagree with it. According to a source I found by the Wilson Center, they summarized a sociologist's poll at the beginning of the war, which found that 83% of Russians over 60 support the war, compared to only 38% of Russians under 30. According to the sociologist Mikhail Sokolov, among the Russians under 30 years old who live in large cities, have higher education, and do not watch TV, the proportion of those who are against the war exceeds 80%. Therefore, it would make sense for the Russian state to try and lower those numbers via spreading their message through social media, right? But I should also mention that when it comes to polling data in Russia, you need to take statistics with a grain of salt. There is a portion of the populace that would say they support the war when in fact they actually don't because they're afraid of the consequences. In fact, there were also a lot of social media influencers who were very critical of what was happening. Lisa Peskova, the daughter of Dmitry Peskov, Vladimir's press secretary, posted a message to her Instagram story that translates to hashtag no war. This message was then promptly deleted. Nikki Proshin shared his anger towards Putin on TikTok to his 750,000 followers in a video that has since also been deleted, but Proshin has also live streamed various marches and protests on his YouTube channel. I also want to say that this military propaganda is not exclusive to Russia because Ukraine is guilty of it too. For example, the ghost of Kiev. This story spread around social media like wildfire at the start of the invasion, but it wasn't real. And likewise, it's been documented around the web that there are several influencers in the Ukrainian army who have been posting about their victories whilst out on the battlefield. This might be a morale tactic, and in fairness, Ukraine has a lot to shout about, being able to go toe to toe with a country that was expected to flatten them within days, but at the same time, it would be very hypocritical of me if I just said all this stuff about Russia without mentioning what was happening across the border. Heading south of Russia now, we land in China, the Red Dragon, because it's time to talk about the Chinese's take on government-led influencers. This is yet another incident I've spoken about in the past. If you've seen my Darkest Depths of VTubers video, you'll know this story. 
But in case you haven't or you forgot, to give you a little recap, back in 2020, the Communist Youth League of China thought that it would be a good idea to reach the next generation via two VTubers, a male and a female that they made. They announced the pair on Weibo, a Twitter-like site for China. They took on a different strategy to their Western counterparts, but perhaps it was a strategy more severe in approach because before they were announced, these VTubers didn't exist. They were expressly made for the tools of propaganda. It wasn't like Alexedra or Swag or Stone Mountain who, for as far as we know, were independent creators for years before being reached out to by the armed forces. Both the female Jiang Xinjiao and the male Hong Ki Man were named after a poem written by Mao Zedong, with the girl's name meaning something along the lines of the beautiful land, and the boy's name roughly translating to red flag flutters free. So it shouldn't be any doubt that these two are the complete creation of propaganda. They had no soul. Their entire existence hinged on the intention of getting people to follow the government. But the people weren't having it. Quickly after the two were announced, it would be made clear that there was no room for them in this world, as the original post got destroyed by a barrage of insults and complaints. According to a source I found by Jake Newby, the people used their announcement to voice their disdain towards the system, asking if Jan Xin Zhao will have to give birth to a boy or whether she'll have to marry before she's 30. One user on Weibo is quoted as saying, I'm your citizen, not your fan. Some users even asked if Jiang Xinjiao would have to shave her head, referencing a controversial state media video in which female medical workers wept silently while men shaved their heads to prevent infection during the coronavirus outbreak. This is all to say that the reception to the VTubers was not a welcomed one. In response to this, the two were scrubbed from Weibo and the youth league tried to sweep them under the rug trying to pretend that it never happened. This was one of the first times in China that severe backlash was held against a project such as this, but it's fair to say that just like in the USA or anywhere else in the world for that matter, even though these first attempts didn't go smoothly, that doesn't mean that they'll be the last. And right next door to China, this takes us up to literally a few weeks ago Ago, when news outlets reported military propaganda being spread by social media influencers within North Korea. It's common knowledge that North Korea is one of the most oppressive and brutal regimes the modern world knows. Their citizens are denied the right to knowledge about the rest of the world and they're fed a falsified fairy tale of how the world is. For the North Korean government to try and control their desired narrative, they've had to employ a number of tactics over the years, from good old fashioned fear to this more recent idea. I'm about to tell you something right now that left me completely jaw dropped when I first heard of it. North Korea have hired a handful of social media influencers to try and paint the country in a positive light, and you can actually watch them right here on YouTube. An insider article I found detailing this noted three separate influencers who are, or at least were at one point, up on YouTube. First up, you have Yumi Space from DPRK Daily. She has 21,000 subscribers and 18 videos, uploading semi-regularly, and her videos show off what it's allegedly like to live in North Korea from a tour guide-ish perspective. She goes to various hotspots like amusement parks, football academies, lakes, restaurants, cafes, she interviews people, and in some videos actually shares North Korean culture. Then there's Sally Parks, or Songa, a girl who appears to be about 11 years old, maybe 12, and her videos are a bit more vlog-like. She has about 30,000 subscribers, and like Yumi Space, she uploads semi-regularly, with one video every few weeks. Last but not least, the article reports on Echo of Truth, who is the biggest of all of these channels with about 45,000 subscribers. The shtick of this channel was to try and debunk the false myths and rumours surrounding North Korea, but in late 2020, the channel was removed from YouTube. The person behind Echo of Truth made a video in response to this, saying that she wanted to dispute fake news about her homeland, and that she didn't know why the Echo of Truth channel was removed, she was just told that it violated Google's policies. So I'm going to take a deeper look into these channels, and legitimately, I am so excited to break these down. I understand that this is a very one-way conversation, but please do drop your thoughts in the comments because I would love to read them. This is purely fascinating to me. Disclaimer, please do not say that my channel sent you or send these channels a bunch of hate. I don't want my names written down in the North Korean logs or whatever. I don't want to be an enemy of the state. So please don't tell them I sent you and don't send hate. With that said, I need to mention that this kind of thing normally isn't allowed in North Korea. 
Defectors who have shared their story in the past have claimed that social media doesn't exist in North Korea, access to the internet in general is quite scarce, and even when it is, it's just a list of approved websites given to you by the government. It's not like you can turn on the computer and then just go scrolling on Facebook. You also can't just pick up a vlog camera like this girl appears to have done, make a video and then upload it to YouTube, this is entirely government pushed content. Speaking of her, let me say that Songa's English is incredible. Even though I think that my English knowledge is enough for me to speak whatever I wish, I went to the Jusong Middle School. That is because um, there is a basketball club in Jusong Middle School. Honestly, I genuinely think that she speaks better English than me, her speech is eloquent, she has a refined RP accent that reminds me of Hermione from Harry Potter, and there might be a reason for this too. Because Songa says that she's a big Harry Potter fan, so it seems to me as though they've taken her personality, what her hobbies are, what her interests are and whatnot, and they've made this hybrid creator that's equal parts human and message. On that note, I want to draw your attention to the comment sections of these videos. Songa's videos have been classed as content for YouTube kids, so there's not a comment section on her stuff. Yumi's videos on the other hand have comments, and when you dig into them, you'll see that there's something a bit strange going on there. If you take a look at the like to dislike ratios on these videos, you'll see that they're quite split, usually around 50-50, but sometimes they lean a bit heavier towards dislikes. Therefore, you'd expect about half the comments to be critical, at least half, but there are very few. An overwhelming majority of all of the comments are positive. For that reason, I think that we can assume that negative comments have been removed, though negative replies are still up now for the most part. Still, I think that it would be a bit naive to assume that whoever's running this account would allow criticism in the comment section. At the same time though, there are a lot of positive comments that seem very weird. Like on Yumi's first video, this user said that the audio work is amazing, even though the audio work sounds like this. Um. And then you have the comments like this. I would love to come to North Korea and taste your sensational ice cream. I'm sure the innovation of new tastes is incomparable in your country. Is this comment meant to be sarcastic or is this guy genuinely that enthusiastic about North Korean ice cream? What's even stranger though is that when you look on these channels, you might expect that they were made by the Koreans themselves and therefore you'd expect to see that they were created like 6 weeks ago and they would only be used to comment on these videos, but these channels are years old, some of them more than a decade. This guy who left the ice cream comment has videos up on his channel, he has a tutorial of some sort of radio, he speaks and writes in German, so could it be that his comment is weirdly worded because he's not speaking his first language? I mean, it's a possibility for sure. In fact, all of these comments could be sincere and genuine because when you think about it, this is genuinely interesting. For the longest time, we haven't seen any North Korean culture in the West, so these channels, even if they are government propaganda, are the slightest glimpses into what it might be like. These sorts of videos are a real rarity in Western society, and it might just be that all of the people commenting on these videos don't know that the content has been approved by the state. At the same time, I wouldn't exactly be shocked if there was something a bit more than meets the eye here. I think that some of these channels might have been bought or taken from their original owners, that's at least my conspiracy theory. Maybe not though, maybe they're just being sarcastic, or maybe these people are legitimately, genuinely interested but to me, something is a bit suspect here, so what do you think? Legitimately, I would love to hear what you guys had to say about this story, or any of the others that I've spoken about in this video for that matter, so if you've got something on your mind, please let me know down in the comments. Nothing like life advice from an influencer with a wedgie! That was a real comment left on the Instagram page of an Australian influencer named Henrietta Moody after her recent motivational post was reviled by her audience. It was July 2023 when this self-proclaimed influencer would make headline news after uploading a video of herself to social media in which she essentially said that wannabe influencers don't achieve their goals because they don't have the follow through. They blame everyone else. They don't take responsibility for their actions and they'll live a shit life unless they wake up to the cold, hard facts. I'm now going to play a little snippet of this controversial video, but it's rife with loud copyrighted music, so I'll I'll just be cutting to the best quotes. 
just trust me, the entire thing is essentially the same. It's not like I'm trying to cherry pick anything out of context. The entire video is just this motivational kind of speech that went horribly wrong. Listen up closely because I am about to change your life. Uh, you are lazy and they are not. Uh, they are disciplined and you are not. Uh, you are full of bullshit excuses and they are not. And every time you think of snoozing your alarm, think of me telling you how lazy you are and that you will forever be a prisoner of your life and then make the decision to prove me wrong and do it for you. It's safe to say that most people were not happy with this post. The comments were ruthless. Sorry, what are your qualifications? Imagine basing your entire day on your appearance and claiming it as success. What a waste of a purposeful life. And of course, the infamous, nothing like life advice from an influencer with a wedgie. It appears as though the biggest problem that people had with her post though, was with Henrietta herself. Because usually in a motivational video such as this, the person giving the speech has gone through something difficult and found inner strength to overcome it. Henrietta on the other hand does OnlyFans for $9.99 a month with the first month free. Many people might argue that due to the nature of her job, she doesn't really have much of a leg to stand on as the platform is very much appearance based. And that means that unless you have perfect cheekbones, piercing eyes and huge breasts through your genetics, the only other way that you can attain them is through surgery. It didn't really help that throughout the video, Moody continually showed shots of her ass. A lot of people seemed to think that the inclusion of her fat cheeks seemed to undermine her point a little bit. A few weeks after the incident cooled down, she would be asked a question through her Instagram and Moody would claim that she calls it how she sees it. That she stands up for a straight, no filtered and no BS approach to life. Her follow up posts were also better received and she seems to have won back her audience ever since even if her growth on Instagram has severely slowed down after the incident, going from just shy of 30,000 when these articles were written to only 33,000 in the six months since. I for one can abstractly understand where she's coming from. She seems to be the kind of person that would rather give you the ugly truth than sugarcoat anything and I can understand even respect that a little bit. I think that oftentimes the best way to get a point across is through tough love, even if it could seem harsh or cruel. I just don't think that this specific video or the word choices that she used within it were the best way to get this point across. Nor do I think that she or any other influencer for that matter should ever be the kind of person to give this kind of speech. Back to it though, our next story concerns a woman named Ariana Fletcher whose actions last year made her reviled on Twitter after her extremely poor treatment of a food delivery driver. So the story goes that Fletcher was a then 27 year old who back in March of 2023 seemed to have a hankering for some food. She decided to call up Uber Eats to get some food delivered, but this would become a grave mistake. For the following events would arguably make her come off as extremely stuck up and entitled. She posted the conversation that herself and an Uber delivery driver had on her Twitter. She seems to have messaged something before because the driver's first message seems to be in response to something that we can't see. But long story short, the driver Sabrina told her that she was going to be using the restroom before delivering this woman's food. Fletcher was clearly having none of it however, telling her to bring the food before she used the restroom, saying that her concierge was waiting. Sabrina then told her that her husband would complete the order but this would never happen as Fletcher would reveal on Twitter that she cancelled the order after this exchange. This is f***ing disgusting and unprofessional as f at Uber Eats. I cancelled my order so fast. I'm never using Uber Eats another day in my life. Y'all workers doing shit like this? F gross! This post would be seen by 13 and a half million people on Twitter, many of whom thought that this was an outrageous thing to tweet and rage at for a multitude of different reasons. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, I can't believe I even have to say this, people are entitled to bathroom breaks. People in the service industry go to the bathroom and then immediately go back to work. They wash their hands, there's a little thing called soap, and it makes it okay. It's kind of grim when you think about it, but it's just the way it is. 
And secondly, it's outrageous that I even have to mention this, but at no point, not a single point between the food being made and it entering your gullet, does the delivery driver even touch it. Well, unless you're the Doritos Locos Taco thief in my previous video, who accidentally left evidence of Dorito dust on her fingers in the picture that she sent. To be honest, it's probably more sanitary that they go to the bathroom right before they deliver your food, because if they've washed their hands, there'll be the least amount of germs on them. Thirdly, this tweet censors nothing except for Ariana's previous message. Sabrina's name and car number are included in the picture, even though it's not needed. You could easily cross her name or number out, but Fletcher chose not to. What this tells me is that it seems as though she was actually trying to get Sabrina fired. I tend to think that the way people treat service staff is very indicative of their character. So if someone is rude to a barista or a waitress or a shop clerk, I tend to think that they're just rotten to their core. And that seems to be the case here. She could have privately messaged Uber if this was such a big problem to her, which it shouldn't have been anyway. But instead, she publicly posted this, tagging Uber in the tweets. To me, this shows clear intention that she was trying to get Sabrina fired from her job. Sabrina even offered to have her husband deliver it, but apparently in Fletcher's world, you can't even be married to a person who's using the bathroom. As you might expect, a lot of people in the replies were calling Fletcher out on her callous treatment of this delivery driver. No, this actually is hella overdramatic, because not only did you not have to post this lady's whole car information, but you're mad at the fact that she went to the bathroom and even offered to let her husband give you the food. It's not like they're actually touching the food sealed inside. I'd be thinking you'll be forgetting these people doing y'all a favor, the way you'll talk to them for real for real, and you'll already know that they don't get paid a lot. At least be patient and understanding. It's weird too, because Fletcher seems to think that you should treat others the same way that they treat you but clearly does not live up to the standard that she sets. For sure, this was yet another example of an entitled influencer who needed to be put back in her place. I for one think that we need a few more rational people with big numbers on social media, so if you're enjoying this video, please make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That said, a more debatable incident occurred around the same time as our previous story, which involved an influencer and a man on a park bench who had a hilarious exchange. This story takes place within a park, seemingly somewhere in the north of England. The accents of the characters involved paired with the fitting grey clouds makes me assume somewhere in the Yorkshire region of the country. The video starts with a woman who claims to have just finished a 5k run and was now speaking to her followers about her fitness journey when an older gentleman comes and sits down. Carry on, man. Well, I can't carry on while you're in the back. Oh. Why not? Because you're in the shot, like you can see it. Yeah. You're literally in the Hello. shot. Yeah. Hello, guys. No one wants to see that. Why not? <laughs> How, how do you know? Who, what, my what followers, people want to I know see? what my followers want to see. You follow us? Yeah, oh, because you're this Jesus is from now, my followers. Yeah, the followers that follow my fitness program. Oh, right, okay. I'm not going to want to see you back there in the dark. And what sort of fit, fitness program is it? It's following my fitness journey. Oh, you want a journey? In case any of you haven't seen this clip before, you might be surprised to discover just how viral it went. On the No Context Brits Twitter page, this three minute clip raked in a whopping 52 million views. It's also received at least 5,000 upvotes on various subreddits such as r slash Karen's, r slash news around you, and r slash TikTok cringe. The video was then reported on by various major British online news platforms such as The Lab Bible and joe.co.uk. Though one major question remained throughout, and that regarded the legitimacy of this video, which to this very day is still questioned. I couldn't find any records of this video prior to an upload by a TikTok channel called It's Gone Viral, uploaded in October 2022, a good few months before the rest of the internet caught wind of the incident. In fact, it was right after the No Context Brits Twitter page posted about this incident that all these articles were made about the clip. Most of them came in late February and early March 2023, despite the clip being at least four months old by that point. Many people within the comment sections were skeptical that this was legitimate, as it seemed almost too perfect. The man walked into her video right as she was starting up her live stream, and his witty retorts sounded almost too good. On top of that, she claims to have set this up on a tripod, but if you study this video, the camera is moving a little bit too much for that to be the case. It's definitely not stable enough for this to be a stationary shot that you would achieve with a tripod. 
Lastly, the woman within the video claims that this was live, though in all of the videos that I could find, both of the faces have been blurred and there are several cuts. Now, this could just be that whoever found this live stream and sent it into It's Gone Viral wanted to cut down the video and protect the privacy of the people involved, but this one is suspicious to say the least. Regardless, this was an ultra viral and incredibly infamous video of an influencer who was called out for her entitlements, real or fake, I think that it deserved a spot in this video for sure. But up next, we'll be discussing something very much real. This is the most serious topic in the entire video. In life, there are several things that just shouldn't go together. Socks and sandals, babies and bleach, but most importantly, influencers and war memorials. It might or might not come to your surprise that over the past decade or so, many war memorial social media platforms across the world, but especially in Europe, have had to put out public service announcements to tell their guests how they should behave. To any sane or rational person, we know that a war memorial is there for us to go and pay respects, to remember the people who paid the ultimate price for the rest of us. These are not places to practice your new poses, and over the past couple of years, there have been several people who have gone viral for their clear lack of respect and empathy for the deceased. For example, this woman who provoked outrage after draping herself over a Holocaust memorial, or this influencer named Tammy Hembrow, who decided that a Lest We Forget monument was the right place to have a photo shoot for the gram, or the subject of this Twitter post, who decided that Auschwitz was the perfect place to express her vanity, what is wrong with these people? Is nothing sacred? It got to a point where back in 2019, the official Auschwitz Twitter page came out with a tweet to take a slight jab at these people, saying that this probably wasn't the best place to learn how to walk across a balance beam, considering those are the same tracks that literally hundreds of thousands of people crossed in order to become victim to one of the largest tragedies in human history. Keep in mind that the site does allow pictures to be taken essentially through the building minus one or two specific locations, and the Twitter page does admit that they understand that some people need a sort of relief from the horrors they see, but this is one of the most sobering, somber, and chilling places in the entire world where you can go to. I'm sure that other war memorials and museums that are dedicated towards tragedies are similar. But it's just common sense. There is absolutely nothing sexy or glamorous or chic about an area that is responsible for the brutal mass murder of families and entire bloodlines. Things got so bad that in the mid to late 2010s, a German-Israeli artist named Shahak Shapira decided to create a piece of work to mock the disrespectful visitors. According to a BBC article, he created a website called Yolocaust and uploaded 12 pictures that people had taken at war memorials that some people might deem as insensitive. These pictures were found on Facebook, Instagram, Tinder and Grindr. And if you were to go onto the Yolocaust website and hover your mouse over these pictures, they would change to pictures taken back in the 1940s. So the backgrounds would change to put them in the setting of the era in which these atrocities were going on. These images have such an incredibly strong visual punch, and the page was eventually visited by 2.5 million people. According to the website, which now has all of these images taken off, this art piece came to the attention of all 12 people who uploaded these selfies, and each of them took the photos off their social media and sent in apology letters. Still, this is a problem that's persisted since, and I don't think it's one that's ever going to go away. As long as vain and stupid people still have access to their phones, they're just going to do vain and stupid things, making entire conflicts and genocides all about them. No, no, this... This whole thing, all of this, it's all about me. And all we can do about it is publicly shame them in YouTube videos until hopefully one day it stops for good. Though one influencer who seems to have stopped for good is a man by the name of Lars. Of the many influencers that we've discussed so far in this video that seem almost too insane to be true, Lars may be perhaps the most delusional of them all. His antics deserve an entire video made about them, but for now, a segment within this video will have to do. So this is Lars. The case of Lars is a curious one indeed, but the best starting point is probably back in mid-2019, after Lars would upload a video with himself to TikTok where he would go to a store, take some ice cream out of a freezer, scoop the ice cream out of the tub with his hands, 
eat it, and place the tub back in the freezer. That very same day, he would upload yet another video to TikTok where he danced to an Iggy Azalea song before dropping a carton of milk. Around the same time, another video, this one created by an influencer who went by the name Bamran, would go viral. In this one, Bamran is seen in a shopping aisle picking up some Listerine, gargling it, and spitting it back into the bottle before walking off. These videos would earn the pair millions of views, as well as a spot on- If you've never seen this interview before, I won't dare ruin it for you. There is a reason why Lars is in this video, as you'll soon see, so let's roll that clip. That statement is wild, and it's actually one that Lars has stuck to over the past few years. In October 2022, so three years after the Dr. Phil interview, that clip seemed to go viral once again, prompting Lars to do the media rounds once more. In an interview on the Kyle and Jackie O show, he reaffirmed this story. So what do your parents say? Like, aren't they a little disappointed that you've just stopped, you've cut them out of your life? They're too busy divorcing and fighting and just being irrelevant. I have five brothers, four sisters. Wow. There's 10 people or 10 kids in the family. All of them I have blocked on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, and I will not talk to them unless they get the same amount of followers as me. If you are genuine in what you're saying, then you will definitely regret this someday down the track, is all I can say. I appreciate the advice. I would never shy away from kind words like that. I appreciate it. But yeah, I do have my own rules. So, yeah. you know, it's going to go in one ear, out the other. Of course. Yeah, I, ga I, I gather that. I love that. his honesty. You I can't knock the bloke for being honest. <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of you are screaming at your screens right now that Lars is clearly a character, and to be fair to you, that could be the case. Lars also had what seemed like a very fake confrontation on a YouTube channel called Street Interviewer. However, this insistent desperation for the headlines must make you wonder the lengths that Lars would go to to achieve his five minutes of fame. And I can answer that question for you right now. Back in March 2020, Lars would go viral once more, this time for licking a toilet. Yeah, we're going there, I guess. Lars would later lie once more and say that he contracted COVID from it, a great story to wrap up a video that was already provocative and bound to become a viral hit. I'm not 100% sure if I'll be able to show this. I feel as though this would break YouTube's guidelines, and I don't even know if you would want to see it because it's just sick. But to summarise the video, it appears to be set in a public bathroom, though this is the cleanest public toilet that I've ever seen, it seems to be almost spotless. This toilet is just begging for a tongue, so Lars goes over to it, drops to his knees, and gives it two big licks on the rim, before doing some smaller licks to it. He would upload this video to Twitter, but then a consequence fitting of a Greek tragedy would befall him. As just like Icarus before him, he would fly too close to the sun, and this video would end up getting him banned from Twitter. Lars's Twitter account, at GaySeanMendez, is to this very day, terminated from Twitter. And with no videos uploaded to its TikTok or pictures put onto his Instagram, Lars over the past year or so has remained very quiet on social media. Perhaps this was all just an act and Lars is a character. Or maybe, just maybe, the real Lars is as we see on screen. And he's so delusional that he actually felt entitled to cut off his family because they weren't giving him clout. Or maybe it's a bit of both. His former partner in crime, Bamran, seems to now make much more restrained TikToks and Instagram posts, so maybe the pair just grew out of it. Perhaps Lars woke up one day and realised that fame and superficiality aren't important in life. Or maybe he's dead. I don't know, but it's strange that he doesn't post anymore. Whatever the case, the legend of Lars is a curious one indeed. On the 10th of July, 2024, while live on the LOLCAL podcast, a popular political streamer named Destiny briefly joined the show to drop a bombshell of an allegation against Boogie2988, real name Stephen Jason Williams. Destiny's claim would send the online world into shock and disgust. You see, in November 2022, Boogie came out on Twitter to claim that he had been diagnosed with polycythemia vera. In case you haven't heard of it, polycythemia vera is a rare type of blood cancer that's described as slow moving, and while potentially life threatening in the long run, can be eased with the proper treatment. He would go on to make a video about the subject, 
with this clip being him confirming it. Turns out I got a rare blood cancer called polycythemia vera, which basically makes your body produce too many red blood cells. And when I started taking that testosterone supplement seven or eight years ago, however long it's been, um, we knew that this was a possibility. You never think you're going to be the guy who gets that side effect though, right? You never think it's going to be you. But some, sometimes it is. It has to be somebody. However, it now seems as though Boogie did not have polycythemia vera, but instead something else called secondary polycythemia. Similar in name, but very different in effect. Now, the problem that many of his critics have is that if you were worried that you misheard the doctor, or you weren't entirely sure what the implications of your illness were, you wouldn't come out onto the internet to say this kind of thing. So, naturally, Destiny felt the need to call him out. Now, an easy way for Boogie to clear up these accusations would be to show someone his medical records. But Boogie was saying that he didn't feel the need to show his medical records because after everything that he's been through and shown online, the specifics of his medical history are the last corner of privacy that he has left. Oh, hey, you need the money! You're not seeing my medical records for 20, not for 50. You're not seeing my medical Five records. Five grand! This is the last thing I have is my medical records. All right, do you care about if this I hand this over, If I hand this over, I've given over literally every goddamn thing. He would hold this stance even after being offered tens of thousands to reveal this information. There was an, I think it was an $80,000 bounty. Like, uh, multiple YouTubers came in and, and offered thousands upon thousands of dollars to Boogie, up to $80,000 to just show a piece of his medical record to a trusted third party so that way they could verify it that he really does have cancer like he claims he does, and he refused. Now, of course, nobody is entitled to this information, but revealing it would put this all to bed especially considering that Boogie has lived his life giving information over to the internet. He was the one that brought this up in the first place. It's very odd that this is where he decides to draw the line, especially considering that giving over this last piece of information would clear his name, but also be very financially beneficial for him too. Keep in mind that this is the exact same person who was literally exposed for scamming his audience via crypto mere weeks before the cancer hoax allegations. He's done a lot more for a lot less. It makes no logical sense that he would turn down a good year's salary to keep his last bastion of privacy a secret, especially when it's known that he has financial struggles. Destiny then went on to claim his theory behind what happened. He claimed that he thought the boogie had secondary polycythemia, which is different to polycythemia vera. This was because the leading causes the boogie claimed to have that led him to developing polycythemia vera were instead more in line with him having secondary polycythemia, which is not cancerous. Boogie, on the other hand, claimed that he was told that he had polycythemia vera and had markers in his blood that confirmed it. Because it was in my blood markers, and that's pretty goddamn definitive. You can Google that, Destiny. When you, when you have the hormones, when you have the hormone in the blood that is produced by this cancer, it's pretty goddamn definitive. It doesn't show up for just the sakes of it. I now, this would be outrageous to lie about considering that Boogie's own father died of cancer, as well as numerous other people in Boogie's life. But with the internet now turned against him, he decided to release a statement regarding the situation on Twitter. It's quite long, so I'll give you a rundown instead of the full thing. He stated, According to the internet, I lied about cancer. However, for the last two years, I've been treating the symptoms of that cancer. Blood tests, medications, and so much more. We still have one test left to do to verify which cancer it is. For now, we've been treating the polycythemia vera, which is the cancer they told me that I have. He went on to say, I was panicked when my doctor told me I had cancer two years ago, and I was in a vulnerable state. I shared that long before I should have. It was a stupid, stupid thing to do. I should have never jumped the gun like that. Finishing the post off by saying, I'm sorry for those hurts or offended by either the rumours that have floated around or by my actions when I spoke too early about my cancer. Of all the mistakes and fuck-ups I've ever made in this life, this was the one that will haunt me to the bitter end, as it should. I'm genuinely sorry. Unfortunately, many people find it very difficult to believe Boogie, especially given the reputation that he's bestowed upon himself over the past few years. He's lied, cheated, manipulated, and craved sympathy for it at every turn. 
and given the circumstances of it, the fact that he was unwilling to give this information over to an unbiased third party was highly suspicious. According to the people that are certain that he's guilty, the likelihood is that he knows that he wouldn't be able to find an official document that made the claim that he had polycythemia vera. But with it being a relatively mild form of cancer in the short term, he could simply claim that he had it to garner support and win over sympathy from people, believing that it would be difficult to definitively disprove. As for a person like him with a laundry list of medical ailments that he already suffers from, this is almost just one to add to the pile. With this being a relatively recent incident, and of course the inspiration for this very video, we'll have to wait and see how this latest controversy will impact Boogie moving forward. Will it cause him to run out of road and force the scraps of his remaining audience to finally abandon him? Will there be any later developments? We'll just have to wait and see. But with the Boogie situation having taken over the internet over the past couple of weeks, it's gotten me thinking what other creators have been accused of faking their illnesses because call me crazy, but it doesn't seem like this is the first time that this has happened. And as it turns out, it's not. Right here, right now, I'm going to cover six different times that YouTubers, creators, and influencers said they had some sort of illness or disease, but were later found out to be lying. So coming up, we have a creator who lied about having sickle cell so that she could cover for getting a Brazilian butt lift, and an influencer whose deceit was so successful that she was able to make an app and write a cookbook before she was caught. Keep in mind that these are just the creators that we know about. There could be several still out there that are faking their illnesses, but we just don't know it yet. But here's one that we do know. Extreme Games. Back in 2018, this Australian duo uploaded a video to YouTube titled, We're quitting YouTube because we're dying, not clickbait. In which, as the title suggests, they made the claim that they were both about to die. The one on the right, named Jonathan, said that he was dying from kidney disease. I've been fighting this kidney disease now for literally four years, and it's finally got the best of me. Whereas the one on the left, called Thomas, said that he was dying from vertigo. Every single day that I wake up, it's like just absolute vertigo. And if you guys don't know what vertigo is, it's like dizziness. Now of all the fake illnesses I'm going to mention today, this one is probably by far the dumbest. Because first of all, vertigo is not exactly what might be considered as deadly. And second of all, all the way through this video, they made it seem as though they were both going to die just at the same time, as if their conditions were dependent on each other. If one dies, the other one just automatically dies too. I mean, in the title, it literally says, we are dying. What a coincidence, and also a rarity that these two 20-something-year-old men are dying of different ailments at the exact same time, and also both happen to have the exact same amount of time to live. And even then, they couldn't keep their story straight. Half the time, it seemed as though they just wanted to quit, saying that it's too hard to carry on, and the other half, they were saying that they had one chance left for salvation, and if their final doctor couldn't cure them, they would both surely die. I'm pretty much down to my last chance. I'm down to my last hope. All I have is this one last doctor that can possibly be the one to heal me. Just by watching this video, it should be fairly evident that the pair were lying about the severity of their situation. They're constantly smirking or storming off to try and increase the drama. It was so obviously fake. And it's hard to tell what they were even going for here. It, it legitimately seems as though they wanted to get caught. What went through their minds here? Who came up with this? Which one do you think said to the other one, oh, I think we should uh, make a little health hoax? I'm sure you're wondering why they would even want to do this. And the answer is fairly simple. For half of the video, they were telling people to subscribe and ring that notification bell for a final giveaway. We want you to know two things. First thing is we're gonna give away two iPhone Xs, two of them. We're literally gonna give away two of them. That's how much we love you guys. All you gotta do is literally like this video, turn on notifications on our channel and subscribe. Now I've never met a YouTuber who is dying. But call me crazy, I don't think an iPhone giveaway is what they would do in that situation. It's almost like they were faking it. And for some reason, they tried to keep up the ruse. They would then make a video called He Sings For His Brother, Don't Cry, in which they doubled down. 
guys, the doctor just told us. Johnny's got four weeks to live. And it's here in this video that they reveal that the doctor they're going to see their last shot at survival to heal their kidney disease and vertigo is a chiropractor. <laughs> They fill out their forms, making sure to tick yes on the would you like to get rid of this problem box, which, like, why is that there? And then the chiropractor gives them a chiropractic adjustment, as you might expect from a chiropractor, though this does seem irrelevant given their illnesses, but apparently that cures them. That's the claim that this video makes. Cracking bones cures kidney disease and vertigo. This was a long saga with the brothers making many more videos about their impending deaths, with creators such as Leon Lush and many others ever since calling them out. From there, the pair doubled down once more, delivering a video that had a little bit more bite to it. In an upload titled The Truth About Us Dying For Views, they come across as actually genuinely believing what they're saying, that a chiropractor had the answers to cancer, kidney disease and other illnesses. Let me clarify that I can't confirm for certain that these two are actually faking their illnesses. In all honesty, it does seem as though Jonathan does have some sort of kidney problems. But having said that, they definitely did fake it in areas. For example, Tom says that he was dismissed by medical professionals for his vertigo, but then somehow still thought that it was deadly. And so to come out and say that he had four weeks left to live is just a blatant lie. You wouldn't make claims like that unless you were certain. As of 20 hours ago, about six years after these videos were made, they're both still alive. The giveaway, by the way, was almost certainly fake. And today, these old videos have since been taken down. Whether it was because they faked the giveaway, faked their claims, had a falling out with their chiropractor, who also seemed to have a YouTube channel, or didn't like the drama that came with it, these videos are now very tough to find with the pair seemingly having cleared out their channel on the Wayback Machine. Nonetheless, it seems like much of this situation was hyperbolized and faked, earning them a spot in this video. But now, moving on to a complete and utter sham in every definition of the word, we have the death of Sketchek. If you've never heard of Sketchek before, he's now infamous on YouTube for a stunt that he pulled back in 2015. You see, Sketchek had created his channel back in 2011 and started constantly uploading in 2013, soon becoming known as one of Team Fortress 2's best players. But by 2015, he had had enough. According to him, video games had ruined his life. But instead of just communicating this with his audience and putting up a video saying that he wanted to walk away from the table, he instead decided to claim that he had contracted a terminal illness that he didn't want to disclose. A wise move considering that this was all a load of codswallop. In a brief three and a half minute video, he would detail that he was done with YouTube and at least according to his doctors, would soon be done with life too. Truth is I've been very sick um, I don't want to reveal too much information about my illness, but the doctors are saying that I probably don't have a lot of time left, and my chances of recovery are looking, uh, low. Of course, his audience didn't know that this was all what you might call Boulder Dash. And to this very day, if you check the right comment section or Reddit thread posted back between 2015 and 2017, you'll see people grieving for this creator. Now, if Sketchek would have left things there, if he left well enough alone, perhaps he would be remembered in a better light. But in 2018, he came back to YouTube to announce that he was not actually dead. About three years ago, I announced that I had contracted a non-specific terminal illness. I want everyone to know that was a lie. I was never ill, not even a little bit. I don't really have an excuse. I mean, what can I say? I just love the feeling of taking someone for a ride, uh, but I took it a bit too far this time. In all honesty, this video was not received too poorly, with roughly a 2.5 to 1 like to dislike ratio. Usually, videos like this receive much more hatred. But then again, the comments on this channel are completely turned off, so it's difficult to find much discourse about Sketchek outside other people's videos on him. However, these days, it might not matter so much. 
because despite SketchUp coming back in 2018, he would once more disappear in 2021, having not uploaded a single video to his channel in almost three years. But from a creator who's currently inactive to one that hosts a weekly podcast, next up to bat we have Daisy Marquez. So if you haven't heard of her, Daisy Marquez is an influencer with 1.7 million followers on Instagram and 1.4 million subscribers on YouTube. She's a very popular woman. But she came under heavy fire early this year for some comments that she made on a podcast that exposed her for lying about an illness a few years back. But before we talk about her self-reporting, we need to take things back about six and a half years to when she made a video talking about why she'd been missing for a few weeks. Now, for most of us creators, if we know that we're going to be away for a couple of weeks, we might pre-record some content in advance, maybe get together some compilations to put up whilst we're away, and if it's a personal enough reason, maybe not even acknowledge it. Daisy, though, didn't do this. Instead, she made a video explaining to her audience that after going to the doctors for a checkup, she had been diagnosed with sickle cell anemia. How should I say it? Like sickle cell disease is like 100% sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait is like 50% should I say. So sickle cell trait is more like you just get the symptoms. So the symptoms are like dizziness, fatigue, weakness, chest pain, muscle pain, which explains so much because ever since I was little, my hands and feet would swell up and that was because I wasn't getting oxygen flow to my hands and feet because of sickle cell anemia. Now, believe it or not, but I'm no doctor. I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Media. Yeah, that was a bad decision. Daisy clearly knows much more about sickle cell and obviously her own medical records than me. But flash forward to January 2024 and Daisy Marquez would completely self-report on the fact that she'd lied about having sickle cell anemia as a way to cover for her getting a BBL, otherwise known as a Brazilian butt lift. So in 2018, I got a BBL. I never denied it. I just never addressed it. I got the surgery and obviously like for the people that have gotten surgery they ask you questions beforehand like about your health and stuff i remember they asked me if you're anemic and i was like yes and they're like okay usually with patients who are anemic you know we'll keep you we'll monitor you afterwards just to make sure because some patients lose a lot of blood some don't okay. like blah blah i remember waking up and this nurse came and she's like hi honey like you know we're just monitoring you like you did lose a lot of blood like we just want to make sure that you're good like she's just like talking to me and she's like so how long have you been anemic for and i was like oh like since i can remember and she's like oh she's like you probably have sickle cell and she just said it just like that dude that is the first time ever ever in my entire life that i had uh -huh. ever even heard that word right and i just remember she said that and i was like yeah yeah like whatever and yeah whatever and then like the third day is like when i was finally coming back to life and and i remember looking at my dms and like message people being like how like where are you where have you been like i hadn't posted on social media for those three days and, and then i go into full panic mode when i tell you I did not think about how difficult the aftermath was going to be. And I remember getting out the surgery and it literally felt like I got ran over by a trailer. I started freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, like, what am I gonna tell my fans? Like, I had no content pre film. Like, I go into full panic mode. And I remember at the time it was just my mom and my ex there with me and they didn't know what to do. And I was just kind of like in a frenzy and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to say that I had sickle cell. So whenever I thought like, oh, I just have sickle cell, I, you know, when you like go, like when you have symptoms and you go on Google and you like self like tells you yourself. The first thing, yeah. Okay. So I, my dumbass, my stupid dumbass really thought that like it was like a cold and you get like a flu. Okay. That's what I thought. People on Reddit and in YouTube comments were livid considering that sickle cell is a horrendous infliction to have. But compared to a lot of the cases I have in this video, it kind of seems as though she got away with it because though a few videos have been made about the situation, none of them gained more than a few dozen thousand views. The video in which she confirmed that she faked it, as well as a few more uploaded around the same time, all have their comments turned off. But at least on Instagram, it's been business as usual for the past half year. Though it's very possible, likely in fact, that she's been deleting comments still definitely deserving of being in this video. Moving on to perhaps the most infamous case we have today, let's discuss ticks and roses. Oh. 
This is Emerald Rose, previously known on TikTok as Ticks and Roses, but now known as an attention-seeking liar. She is now one of, or perhaps even the most, infamous creator in online history to be accused of faking an illness. In this instance, faking Tourette's syndrome, with videos covering her story reaching view counts in the tens of millions. In case you don't know what Tourette's is, it's described on the NHS website as a condition that causes a person to make involuntary sounds and movements called tics. It usually starts during childhood, but the tics and other symptoms usually improve after several years and sometimes go away completely. People started to become suspicious with Rose after discovering previous live streams and videos of her on the internet in which she didn't tick at all. Which was strange considering that within her TikTok videos, it would appear as though she had quite an aggressive form of Tourette's, with her ticking quite a lot. In many instances, she couldn't get through single sentences without her ticks kicking in on multiple occasions and making her fully unable to make her point. Well, and I wanted to talk a little bit about. Wow! 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 I wanted to talk. Wow! 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 I wanted to talk a little bit about- Wow! 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 Never mind. After pressure began to build, Emerald would release a medical document that was meant to clear her name, but it did quite the opposite. People noticed a few flaws and mistakes in this document, such as PTSD being written down twice and an inaccurate logo. These clues would make it seem as though Rose herself had forged this. It didn't help that she would delete comments, take the video down, and scrub her Instagram of all of its content. It was beginning to appear more and more as if Emerald had read through the South Park playbook and was now pulling a Cartman lying about having Tourette's. Tourette's syndrome? What is that, mommy? Butthole! Titties! Bowels! Now, it did seem as though Rose did have an illness, but it wasn't Tourette's, but rather Huntington's disease, which is characterised by having involuntary muscle movements. However, it is not Tourette's. Shortly after this incident began to go viral, it caught the attention of none other than Emerald's sister, under the username Jade4101. Jade confirmed that she did not believe that her sister had Tourette's, something that as a family member, she would know because Tourette's, as we know, most often rears its head in early childhood. Jade would go on to say that Emerald was mentally ill though, but she did not support what Emerald had done, calling it incredibly disrespectful and fake. And then, very shortly after, the Ticks and Roses TikTok account would be no more. Facing disgust and outrage, Emerald Rose is now no longer active on social media. But I want to take things full circle now to talk about, perhaps, the most vicious and audacious case we have today. That being of Mrs. Bell Gibson. Belle Gibson was an Australian Instagram creator who was told that she only had four months to live after being diagnosed with brain cancer. Her story really begins after she avoided traditional methods of treatment and opted for an alternative approach via diet, exercise and natural medicine, which against all odds she claimed worked and saved her life. With a story like this, it's not hard to see why she gained a following so quickly. In theory, she literally had the cure for cancer. She shared her story on her Instagram account, as well as various recipes that she claimed helped her through her treatment. Within two years, she had the best part of 200,000 followers, fame, fortune, a positive reputation after claiming to donate vast sums of money to various different charities, an app that was downloaded 200,000 times in its first month, and a cookbook to go along with it that released in November 2014. But it was this book that many people consider to be the beginning of the end for Gibson's claims, as her web of lies began to untangle. She made the claim that she developed malignant brain, blood, spleen, uterine, liver and kidney cancers in response to a cervical cancer vaccination. She also claimed to have had heart surgery, having at one point died on the operating table and claimed to have previously had a stroke. All of this without being able to supply any evidence that any of the claims were true. 
As people started to read into this book, they began to notice some other claims that she made. Alternative methods of medicine that she claimed worked, but were often dismissed by the professionals. For example, she was anti-vaccination and promoted the consumption of unpasteurized raw milk. According to the American Food and Drug Administration, known as the FDA, it states that raw milk can carry dangerous germs such as Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, Campylobacter, and others that cause foodborne illnesses, often called food poisoning, which can especially be dangerous to people with weakened immune systems, aka people with cancer. The tide was now turning against Gibson, and it wouldn't be long before things went from bad to worse. People began to comment on her Instagram that she was shilling a lie, but these comments were swiftly deleted. The microscope was now firmly on this influencer, but the worst was yet to come. As I mentioned before, Belle was known for her medical claims, app, and book, all of which were now coming under scrutiny. But she was also known for her philanthropy, which would also come undone when it was discovered by Fairfax Media that despite her claim to have donated $300,000 to various charities that funded maternal healthcare in developing nations, schools in sub-Saharan Africa, and medical support for children with cancer, in reality, only $7,000, a mere 2.3% of what she claimed, actually went to charity. And $1,000 of that was after she found out that Fairfax were looking into her claims. She had also claimed to have donated to the parents of a child that had cancer, parents that she had befriended back in 2013. The parents were unaware that she was out there making these claims and confirmed to the media that no, they had not received any donations from her. In fact, they were now under the suspicion that she had just used their friendship to benefit herself speaking to them as a method of understanding from first-hand sources what it would be like living with cancer, or having someone so close that does. After they confronted her about her cancer and charity falsifications, they claim that she turned her back on them. Around this time, in early 2015, her book was pulled from the shelves, her app was deactivated, and her Instagram was deleted. In April, she admitted to lying about her cancer claims, making the assertion that when she wrote that she had cancer, though it wasn't true, she genuinely thought that she had it. While she accepted that she did not have cancer, that she believed that she did, so that she'd been acting in good faith. Well, when I was writing that, I thought that I did. In the case of Belle Gibson, everything turned out to be a lie. Even small things like her age turned out to be lies. She claimed that she was 26, but her medical record showed that she was actually 23. And the recipes that she claimed were hers were actually just stolen from the internet. People were questioning whether she was a pathological liar, but Gibson denied it. Based upon medical records that the media were able to obtain, Gibson would have known that she did not have brain cancer. So even within interviews, she was once more lying. And ever since her lies were busted, she's been in deep legal trouble. In February 2017, it was found in a court of law that Gibson's claims had been misleading and deceptive, and that, according to the judge, Miss Gibson had no reasonable basis to believe that she had cancer from the time she began making these claims in public to promote the whole pantry book and the apps in mid-2013. But there was not enough evidence to prove that she was not acting out of delusion. In September, she was fined $410,000 for making false claims about donating to charity, which as of May 2021, had not been paid, causing the police to raid her house. This is despite the fact that in 2019, she had enough money to take trips to Africa and Bali. Around this time, she also claimed to have been adopted by an Ethiopian community called the Oromo, but this also turned out to be a big fat lie. Three years on from that, and sources suggest that her fine has now grown to more than half a million dollars due to interest. It's currently unclear if she'll ever pay the fine, but honestly, at this point, I doubt it. So that's that. I really hope you enjoyed this compilation, and if you did, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. 
We are unbearably close to 150,000 subscribers right now. We're like 2,000 away or something. It's a milestone that I never thought that I would reach. So from the depths of my heart and soul, please subscribe if you enjoyed this. Also, if you're still in the mood to check out another one of my compilations, maybe to listen to whilst you're doing your homework or you're on a long road trip or a flight or you just haven't gotten to sleep yet, then why not check out my video on the worst of the internet's fan bases. In that video, which is more than an hour long, I discuss the unhinged incidents from the weeb, VTuber and brony communities. I would wholeheartedly recommend checking it out, click on the screen now to watch it. Aside from that, I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you later.